looks fine. So, yeah, so today we will basically uh, summarize what we have been doing in the last uh, 40 odd classes. I will start by uh, before we recollect, collectively recollect, right, what, uh, what we have done so far. I will just sort of make a, an observation on what, you, what we have been doing so far, okay. So though it is supposed to be uh, computational fluid dynamics, an introduction to computational fluid dynamics, you realize that basically what we have done is we have looked at ways by which we can solve uh, differential equations, right, and variational problems, how to represent them on the computer and how to get solutions of a numerical nature, okay. So I want to put that in in some kind of a context, in a, in the, in a context in the sense now I want to make it a very broad context. So far we have been acting as though it is fluid dynamics but if you think about it I have not really mentioned fluids that much, maybe I have mentioned a little gas dynamics uh, along the way, right. I mean we have, but we have not really spent, we have not really, uh, the equations were not like the full flow, full fledged fluid equations or whatever, we have looked at Euler equations and so on, okay, right. So just to put that in context I want to draw graphically show you uh, something about the nature of how these things work okay just a big big picture just a big picture so on the one hand okay i have uh, we will i will maybe even color this i'll color it i'll fill it inside on the one hand that picture is supposed to represent reality as it is right what we are trying to model as it is and if I am able to reproduce it but if I am not able to reproduce it exactly it does not matter okay. So I will say does that make sense and from here to here now I am going to write processes okay this is perception this is what we see. perception that is what we see whether you use a microscope to see or whether you use uh, right whether you just look when we talked about uh, when we talked about uh, deriving the governing equations in one of the classes I sort of waved my hands around and said molecules what molecules no molecules right I do not I do not see the molecules am I making sense we may be able to infer that they are there but a phenomenological attitude would be continue it is continuous media around okay. So that would be perception this is what we this is this is what we see and the trouble with perception is there is a lot of detail I mean benches carpeting I means a lot of detail lot of fine grained detail we cannot handle that much detail okay. So even from what we so there are things that that we do not see that there are things that we just cannot see I mean we are unlikely to see the locations of every molecule at every point at a given instant you know it is it, it, it is not going to work. So we come up with we throw away what we think is the detail, we throw away the details, we throw away the details and come out with a mathematical model and for a mathematical model of course what am I going to choose is the geometrical shape as close a circle as I can get right. So we come up with a mathematical model okay so this is a big picture of what we are doing is the reality this is what we see cannot handle the detail mathematical model and very often as in the case of the Navier Stokes equations and so on cannot handle the mathematical model okay. So then we go where do we go then we go to the computer. Okay, so this is deliberately, of course, it is clearly geometrically supposed to represent the fact that this has an infinite number of sides that has only a finite number of sides. So, one of the things that we have looked at is, for instance, we asked the question of consistency. So, if the number of sides keep increasing, does this become the circle, right? Does the solution go? Does the model go? There are questions that we have asked. So, there is an issue of verifying that this is indeed this you have written a program right so actually I just say computer model 
this itself you can add levels there is the chalk dust that we write right of the finite difference scheme or whatever then there is the actual program which is a representation of that algorithm actual representation of the algorithm on that particular computer and then there is the issue of whether does that represent the algorithm that you set out to implement does this become this you understand or does it you may want to verify whether that is correct so you can verify whether this is correct this is called very often this is called validation okay right from here to here of course we we actually called it consistent you understand what I am saying so this is sort of the big picture this is what we have this is what we see this is what we are hoping we can do this is the mathematical language this is the abstraction from this abstract abstract basically means to extract right you abstract out the essentials and throw away the non essential and if by chance you throw away something that is an essential that is a different story but you throw away you abstract out the essentials and you do not worry that because that is how science works the science works on generalities science works on things that are common the particular is of no interest to science we want to make a general statement. Right, we are, we are not the particular is of no, is no of no interest to us. Right, so we abstract out, we abstract out, we abstract out the general, and very often we find that this we can't solve this. Right, this is where we are. So actual fluid, uh, what we see, Navier-Stokes equations, finite difference method. That's one way to look at it. Is that fine? Okay, everyone. Okay, so. Uh, I, as I said I just wanted to talk about this so that we had this uh, we have this general context in which we can look at the look at the course and possibly some of the material that you have seen elsewhere. So why do not we see if we are able to do a, a review of the material that we have covered so far okay fine where did we start we have about 40 odd minutes in which we can cover the 1 minute per, per day is essentially where here right so where did we start what is the what is the start? Hmm? Representation of numbers. Yeah. So we had we first, we basically said that we started off with the idea that the problems that we are solving have solutions which are functions. If you remember the problems that we are solving have solutions which are functions. So we need to be able to represent functions on the computer, right? So we sort of realized that oh we have to be able to represent things on the computer. So towards that end we basically said that let us see how things are represented on the computer okay that is where we that is where we so that was the motivation all the equations that we solve typically end up being the solutions end up being what we mean when we solve it is not like x squared equals 2 therefore x is square root of 2 right. So you get a nice number whereas what we have are more like functional equations equations for which the solutions are functions we basically said oh if I want to solve that on a computer then I need to be able to represent the solution on the computer I need to be represent, able to represent the problem on the computer. So how does one represent things on the computer right and we started by saying how do we, how do we represent well integers so computers are good at representing integers how do you represent the real line and computers are not good at representing the real line that is what we found right right at the real line we found that the computers are not good at representing the real line right. So the real line was the first time that we encountered uh, a represent a form of representation error called floating point round off error right. So of course there is fixed point and floating point I will just mention that since I inadvertently said floating point. So we have fixed point representation and floating point representation fixed point representation is just like dealing with integers it is just like having an integer and assuming the uh, decimal point is at set as at a set point floating point of course the decimal point in theory moves because you have an exponent fine right. So the representation errors one of the things that you have to take from this course the representation error in numbers has a special name it is called round off error okay. So anytime you are basically asked oh, what is the error that you get and the round off error what is the round off error round off error is the difference between the number and its representation on that computer okay. So and that computer could be a piece of paper you decide that you are going to represent a number using three decimal places then you are the computer right and then then that is three decimal places right is what you are going to have and therefore that would be the difference. Now if you read and I can see smiles but if you read old books when they say the computer should be careful they really mean you 
right. So, you go back and get uh, a numerical analysis book from 1940s or whatever and they are saying the computer should be careful. They really do mean you, you as the individual doing the computing, okay, fine, right. So, that is as far as the that is far as far as representing numbers goes and once we have said we can represent numbers obviously we look at other mathematical entities and an obvious mathematical entity that we have is a vector or an array, an array is a general idea in computers. So, whether you can represent vectors and matrices, okay. You can represent matrices but if you want most programming languages will not do the matrix algebra, they would not do the matrix addition, you have to do it, okay. Most programming languages will not do that for you, there may be a few that do it but most will not do it for you. Okay, right. So it's possible. And how did we represent? How did we represent uh, matrices? So we represented matrices and vectors by basically, well, vectors we represented by basically uh, locating in memory in a sequential fashion, right? We were able to say that uh, there are there are so the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements, right? Placed uh, placed adjacent to each other could represent a vector right in a one dimensional array inherently so we you are using the term array right and of course if you wanted to go make get a matrix you could then stack one on top of the other okay that was the idea right so it's actually possible to get a single subscript object ai or a double subscript object aij okay or even a triple subscripted object and so on and then what you do is you take whatever it is that you have stacked in the second dimension, you would stack it in the third dimension. So then you know that you can actually create multidimensional arrays. It is actually possible to create multidimensional arrays. Is that fine? Okay. So by now what we have done is we have managed to represent integers, numbers, real line. We are able to represent then using those uh, integers and uh, real numbers so to speak, real line. We are able to represent matrices or arrays right one dimensional arrays two dimensional arrays multi dimensional arrays. So the second thing to do is now we have a state where we are talking about representing functions right. So what did we do after that what did what was the how did we go about that we did a little we did a, we set up the we looked for function basis. So we did a little review of vector algebra right we showed how we constructed vectors in uh, the normal vector algebra vector, when I say vector algebra the algebra that you learn in, in your college we did a little vector algebra and showed that well if you had the dot product it was enough for you to actually construct okay it was enough for you to actually construct uh, a set of basis vectors and so on given a linearly independent set of vectors that span that space that you are interested in okay. So what we did was we constructed box functions and here this was the first thing that we did we constructed box box functions. So the box functions were two of were were two of two kinds we constructed a box function uh, f and g I am not going to do all the details as I said though it is a quick recollect right we constructed box functions f, f and g and basically said that on non overlapping intervals if the box function is 0 right in this case it is 0 here 0 here and the intervals do not overlap remember wherever the function is non zero it is called the, the domain the part of the domain where the function is non zero is called the support of the domain okay. So the supports of the the support of the function the supports of the two functions are non overlapping and the functions turn out to be orthogonal that is one way to get orthogonality. The other way that you get orthogonality is uh, that the functions somehow change signs appropriately right like trig functions sin x and cosine x right occupy the same interval they are defined on the same interval 0 to 2 pi but they are still orthogonal to each other okay right. So we were able to show that we could represent functions using function basis using the box function and we saw again that there is a representation error okay we again saw that there was a representation error for the box function we asked ourselves the question what is the nature of the representation error. The reason why we ask ourselves what is the error at, at the that question is important is can I get an idea of what is the error because if you know what is the error you can then try to get an idea as to where the error is coming from and then there is scope for improvement okay. So as I keep repeating it is not just enough that what we do that those are skills but you should also see there is a higher level skill that you have to aim at you have to look at the process that we are going through right. So you always ask so you do something 
then you have to ask the question how good is it is there a way that I can get an idea as how good is it because the minute you are able to quantify it then there is scope for improvement okay that is very important. So we ask the question this representation error and then we our analysis basically showed I mean these are constant so you can represent constant functions exactly and nothing else okay. So basically what we then did was we said we will go to higher order polynomials of course one of the disadvantages this had was that a representation using box function what was the bad thing that had that had that it had you had a lot of jumps you had a lot of jumps so in fact I think I used a straight line you get a lot of jumps they are non overlapping so I have to make sure that you get a lot of jumps it gets the function is very jumpy you can get closer and closer to the solution but the function just gets jumpier and jumpier okay. The alternative to this was saying that well we got orthogonality this way but we know that using something like the Gram-Schmidt process or whatever right we could make functions you can get come up with an independent set even if they are overlapping. So we looked at the set of polynomials 1x x squared and so on okay on an interval we have to specify the interval on an interval. So on minus 1 to plus 1 for instance 1 and x are orthogonal to each other on 0 to 1 they are not if they are not orthogonal to each other you can subtract from x its projection on 1 and get an orthogonal set you understand what I am saying and then you can build up an orthogonal set using this that is what we saw right. However just like sin x cosin x and so on this has a problem so if on the whole interval on which you are trying to represent a function you represent the function using a, a series a 1 x x squared and so on or an orthogonal set formed from it any change in coefficient will change the function on the whole domain whereas box functions have something called locality right so I want to I want to recollect that locality box functions have something called locality which allows you to locally change the value locally move the thing move the function value the representation without affecting anything elsewhere okay right so now we are able to represent functions we got we we basically combined this idea this with the non overlapping uh, what should I say uh, intervals or supports to construct hat functions to function to construct functions that look like this I just call it f to construct hat functions okay the hat function was 1 at the node at which it is defined and 0 at the adjacent grid points okay 0 at the adjacent grid point is that fine everyone okay. So we were then able to get linear interpolants we are able to get linear interpolants however what was the uh, disadvantage that you have overlap of adjacent right which can create interesting things like in the last part one class right <laughs> it can create interesting situations okay but you have overlap and it is always a problem see orthogonality that is the reason why we seek orthogonality because otherwise you do not have uh, right but on the other hand you get linear and we saw that you could do not only linear you can do quadratic you can do cubic am I making sense right so you can your interpolants your basis functions can be any order that you choose there are many ways by which we can choose it okay so I think I did uh, I mentioned quadratic and I did cubic in, in class right if I remember right okay what else could you do what did we do after that we got an estimate of the representation error here then we basically turned around and said well if I know the function I can use this for a representation but what if I do not know the function ahead of time that was the motivation that I used okay if I do not know the function ahead of time what do I do right. So then we used Taylor series and we came up with a finite different rep representation so I am not uh, the finite difference representation of course basically made use of the fact I am not going to use i's and j's as the indices I am going to just make a general statement made use of the fact that if you have the function value f of b and you have the function value f of a. then what is fb minus fb minus fa 
divided by b minus a this looks like something for mean value theorem right. So mean value theorem says that there is some point in between some point unknown location psi at which this is the exact derivative right for a continuous function there. Now what we know is that if I represent this using Taylor series if I represent this if I say see if b minus fa divided by b minus a is a number right is a number just say it is 2. So you calculate this and you get the answer 2. What it basically says is if you say 2 is the derivative there the representation is first order representation the error is of the is proportional to b minus a if you assume that it is the derivative there if you say 2 is the derivative there that is the approximation that you are making right that is the approximation that you are making then the representation is first order right the representation is still first order the sign of the error changes and if you assume that it is the representation of the derivative the same number 2 if you assume that it is the derivative at the midpoint then the error becomes second order b minus a whole square okay is that fine. So here here it turns out that the derivative the, the derivative corresponds to the function being represented by linear linear and there it is actually quadratic okay you look at the you look at the term it is as though the function is represented by a quadratic even though it is actually you are drawn a straight line okay. So the same number and as I said unfortunately mean value theorem says that at some unknown point it is exact but we do not know that is the whole that is the whole that is the whole deal right. So at some unknown point in between it is exactly the right it is and you know we are looking at it graphically you can just basically say oh it is most probably at that point right graphically yes but in reality we do not know what it is. So that is basically the idea of so finite differences and we found the truncation error using Taylor series right truncation error. So I introduced that term truncation error is if you have an infinite series you truncate you throw away you eliminate all the higher order terms and re retain only the leading terms. The error that you do you make uh, doing that is called truncation error. What else did we do after that? What was the uh, once we have finite difference represent so we can represent first derivatives, second derivatives. We figured out we showed that we could represent higher order derivatives, right? Then we turned around and said, okay, why don't we apply it to solving an equation? And we took Laplace's equation as the start, right? And Laplace's equation was relatively easy. Laplace's equation is relatively easy and we basically showed that Laplace's equation nabla squared phi equals 0 this is an equation that I have written many times <laughs> many times in this class. So you could do right phi at p cube was a quarter of basically the average of the neighbors okay summation neighbors right neighboring fees summation so it is average of the neighbors Laplace's equation turned out to be averaging of the neighbors and we use that fact that it was averaging to actually show that what did we show we showed that yeah the solution is unique you do understand that two of you cannot get two different answers and so on right that the solution is unique we use that averaging to show that there is a there is a principle called maximum principle that it satisfies that the, the maximum and minimum in this case actually occurs on the boundary okay we we proved as a consequence that maximum and minimum occur on the boundary am i making sense and use that to then show that the solution was unique for the numerical case you may have seen for the continuous case for the discrete case we showed it only for the discrete case okay so what else did we do with laplace's equation what did we do next we looked at some acceleration schemes in particular we looked at sor so we basically said that well if you have a fee that comes from this instead of calling it phi n plus 1 we called it phi star and it is possible to take a linear combination of the proposed solution and the current solution. So to get phi n plus 1 you could get omega times phi star plus 1 minus omega times the old one okay and we looked for ways by which we could find omega the optimal omega like we said this is a situ this is a situation where we are looking for non uniform convergence if it is uniform convergence then omega is, you know it, it does not help we want as a function of we want the convergence rate to change as omega and we found that there is actually a way to find the optimal omega okay by systematically hunting there is a there is no analytic method by which you can do it but you can systematically hunt for a optimal omega is that fine we also showed that 
solving this was the same as solving a system of equations solving this is the same as solving a system of equations so we had what we showed that it was the same as solving a x tilde a equals b tilde right which was the same as minimizing a functional q of x tilde equals minus one half or one half it depends which way you want to take it uh, x tilde transpose a x tilde minus b x tilde b x transpose b because I think I did that at least twice we went through some interesting errors there but anyway it is fine okay. So we basically showed that this was minimizing this right it is the same minimizing this is the same as solving that a remember is symmetric that is an important property here a is symmetric a equals a transpose a is symmetric okay a is symmetric and there are some interesting properties but anyway we won't we won't worry about it and we showed for sor as a consequence why omega has to be in the interval in the range 0 2 so that we got a uh, an idea that we have to pick omega within the range for this linear equation omega should be within 0 and 2 and we looked at hunting we looked at a few demos you have tried it out okay right and uh, we found that for Laplace's equation at least that omega is very close to 2. What was the other thing that we did anything else Laplace's equation. Then we looked at what is the convergence rate basically right we looked at how quickly does it converge and indeed we found that uh, then because again uh, using the same principle we found uh, the keyword that you used the error we found out what is the error and we basically once we got the expression for the error we asked the question how quickly is it decaying and that gave us an idea of convergence rate in a funny fashion I introduced the ideas of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and the spectral radius the largest eigenvalue right so rho of a or rho of I think if I if I remember right I call the iteration matrix p sub j for Jacobi iteration rho of p, p sub j is the value of the largest Eigen value or the largest Eigen value okay the magnitude of the largest Eigen value it is called the spectral radius of that matrix and we basically showed that you want the spectral radius of the matrix to be less than 1 for convergence that is fine but that is not enough that is that is that is that is okay if you are saying, saying does it converge eventually but eventually is not good enough right and we found that actually for this class of problems rho j rho of p j is extremely large it is very close to 1 it is very close to 1 so there are some issues there okay there are some issues there SOR is one of those things that sort of helped us fix that issue but there are some issues there then what did we do we looked at we changed gears and looked at linear wave equation right we looked at linear wave equation linear wave equation Laplace's equation is averaging right averaging basically means if there are differences you eliminate differences linear wave equation was different linear wave equation is propagating whatever there is is carried it is like a stream the example I gave a stream of water flowing at chalk dust chalk dust is carried at that speed okay so linear wave equation basically looks like And we tried a variety of schemes for this just like we it worked things worked for Laplace's equation we just tried a variety of schemes for it. that was sort of deliberately set up because I wanted to make sure that since Laplace's equation everything worked I wanted to do the same thing and I mean I, we obviously know I obviously know that they are not going to work we tried forward time central space which was unconditionally unstable. So the stability analysis we looked at the von Neumann stability analysis right we basically linearized stability analysis anyway it is already linear so it does not matter but we added right we looked at uh, the same kinds of exponentials that we looked at when we are looking at the error term here and showed that and showed that forward time central space was unconditionally unstable there is nothing that you could you do right forward time central space was unconditionally unstable and in all of this discretization of course we came up with a parameter which we called sigma which was the current Friedrich Levy, Levy number okay and uh, this number turned out to be pretty critical right so anyway maybe I am getting a little ahead of myself here we also did FTC, FTFS I should not forget that which is also un unconditionally and then finally we found we did 
FTBS forward time central backward space and basically showed that if the current Friedrich Levy number is less than 1 that is we had a condition we got a condition. FTFS in fact basically gave us the idea and from here we got the idea of upwinding that is FTFS did not work but FTBS worked because A is positive and if the sign of A changed if A became negative then FTFS would work and FTBS would not work right. So the equation is propagating propagating u in a certain direction I generally use the word some information but your equation is propagating u in a certain direction and your scheme also it looked like needed to propagate you in the same direction is that fine. So to which we asked the question so what is the difference between FTBS and FTCS well I guess before we did that what did we do after that we looked at the modified equation we asked ourselves the question what is the problem that we are actually solving right and we got from that the modified equation the modified equation the modified equation looked something like this it had terms which were of that form higher order derivative so we asked ourselves the question what would each one of these things do in fact we looked at it up to the fourth derivative and we concluded that the odd derivatives are dispersive in nature for this equation and the even derivatives are dissipative in nature whether the u decays or is amplified depends on the sign of u and the nature of the derivative so in this case mu2 has to be positive in this case mu mu4 has to be negative that is what we conclude okay right and this is just dispersive so we saw we saw decay and we saw dispersion dispersion basically means high frequencies and low frequencies travel at different speeds okay so we which is a very critical very, very important phenomenon okay various frequent different frequencies travel at different speeds. So then we came back and asked ourselves the question what is the difference between FTCS and FTBS how come this does not this works and this does not work and we realized the difference was that in one case the mu2 was negative and the other case the mu2 was positive for the modified equation. So the natural question was cannot I just use FTCS and add a little amount of artificial viscosity okay which we have tried it actually works fine okay and that FTCS the relationship between so any scheme literally can be written as FTCS plus an appropriate correction right if you choose to if you choose to do it okay so that is as far as uh, so from here did we do anything else with linear wave equation then we looked at the quasi linear wave equation and showed that. and of course the general form where f is a function of u and we showed that in this case in this case right where uh, where there were no discontinuities to start with in the original function is smooth the initial condition is smooth the discontinuity can form so which is an interesting combination on the other hand you have diffusion or Laplace's equation kind of which is averaging out and eliminating discontinuities high frequencies are decaying faster than low frequencies that is one of the outcomes of this which I forgot to recollect important outcome high frequencies decay faster than low frequencies. So that being the effect of the right hand side this was just interesting that this was creating the high frequencies right and I pointed out that if you have in a, in a different context I had pointed out that if you have u dou u dou x and if you substituted sin theta if u is like sin theta then dou u dou x is like cos theta. So sin theta cos theta is like sin 2 theta so there is an increasing there is a mechanism that increases the frequency that doubles the frequency which is very critical okay. So this this quasi linear this term seems to do that it seems to increase the frequency on the other hand this seems to try to decay and that combination is what of course makes fluid mechanics so interesting okay. So then from here what else did we do of course we derived the uh, if you get a discontinuity it is called a shock and we derived the rankin huguenot conditions for the shock speed and so on fine then what else did we do we looked at one dimensional flow we derived the governing equations looked at one dimensional flow we tried the FTCS plus dissipation for it right we tried first of all to make the equation look like uh, uh, this linear wave equation so we got it in a so we wrote it in two forms we wrote it in a conservative form and a non conservative form maybe I will just write the equation we 
dou q dou t plus dou e dou x equals 0, q was rho, rho u, rho total energy and e of course is rho u, rho u squared plus p, rho e t plus p times u, okay, right. These variables are said to be the conservative variables written in a divergence free form mathematically said to be written in a conservative form. For us of course from gas dynamics we know that across a shock these quantities are conserved so you can give any reason you want as to why you want to call it a conservative form but these are called conservative variables as a consequence even if you write it in a non-conservative form. So you can use you can still write this in a non-conservative form in sort of a desperate attempt to make it look like the wave equation linear wave equation right where this term the flux Jacobian is dou E dou Q okay the flux Jacobian is dou E dou Q and then we said oh the system is coupled is not there something that we can do to decouple it we tried to do change the variables from Q to Q tilde which was rho U P and that did not help either that still gave a coupled system of equations dou Q dou T plus A tilde dou Q tilde dou x equals 0 in terms of q tildes which are not non-conservative variables a certain combination of course we could have used rho u t also right right so and it turned out this was still coupled then we said hey, wait a minute I can relate these two to each other with a similarity transformation I can transform this equation to this equation and the a and a tilde will be related through a similarity transformation then we asked ourselves the question is there a transformation that will diagonalize the matrix right. So if you use the modal matrix of A or you use the modal matrix of A tilde the matrix made up of eigenvectors of A then it is actually possible to diagonalize it and we got the characteristic form okay where the system of equations was diagonalized and it was decoupled right. So we got three equations that were basically propagating you are propagating like the wave equation okay right but not linear wave equation because they happen to it is a quasi linear wave equation but at least our analysis is what would work and the CFL condition for this if we do a discretization and we got the current number at least the current Friedrich Levy number would be of the form u delta t by delta x that would be sigma. I guess you could say u plus a or mod u plus a or whatever that would be the largest current number am I making sense okay and the typical stability condition would require that this is less than 1 is that fine okay we are using mod u because u can be positive or negative a is the speed of sound okay are there any questions anything else what did we do after that we looked at the critical part of applying boundary conditions and applying boundary conditions we decided to use the fact that the this equation is propagating in a certain direction determined by A. So at a subsonic inlet at a subsonic inlet so the eigenvalues or the lambdas in that equation were u, u plus A, u minus A where A is the speed of sound. So at a subsonic inlet these two are positive that is negative so at the inlet these two are propagating into the domain this is propagating out of the domain and we use that to determine boundary conditions. So typically at the inlet we applied V applied for flow through a pipe P0 and T0 at the inlet and P ambient at the exit because it is a subsonic exit this is negative this is positive these two are positive so these are propagating out of our domain at the exit whereas this is propagating back into the domain am I making sense is that okay fine. So we needed three quantities we have we have developed three we have got three quantities but actually at each point we need to get three each so we have to get three more right which we did by extrapolating so if I actually write the domain and show the grid points the, the first grid point and the penultimate grid point and the last grid point then we basically said that there are certain quantities that have to be extrapolated and we explored various things that you could do use to extrapolate to the to the boundary right and this is very important. So the emphasis here is there are boundary conditions that 
you recollect there are boundary conditions that are required by the physics of the problem. Your pressure vessel, it, the air in it has a certain P0, it has a certain T0, these are measurable quantities. You have a pipe, you have a valve, there is an ambient pressure, you open the valve, the ambient pressure and the P0 basically determine what is the speed with which the air is going to flow, am I making sense and the T0 will help you determine the other parameters, that is what the physics requires. The mathematics basically says that you need three quantities because plus an initial condition because you have a single time derivative and you have a single spatial derivative, first order spatial, derivative, first degree spatial and we have three quantities. But the numerical algorithm insists that you need Q here and Q there and therefore you have to generate the numerics requires more boundary conditions. So we have to actually generate those boundary conditions, we have no choice, is that fine, okay. So then of course we also wrote one important thing that we did was we wrote this in the delta form and this is a we wrote the equation in delta form I will just write one one uh, as I said and none of these uh, these are just to recollect where R is the residue. I have not defined in the recollection, I have not defined the residue so far. The residue is if you, saw, if you have an equation and you substitute a potential solution into the, that equation, if the right hand side does not match, whatever is left over is called the residue, okay. So if you have LU equals 0 and you substitute a candidate U and you do not get a 0 but you get some value that is called the residue, whatever it leaves is called the residue, that is the residue from the steady state Euler equation and this is the delta form, this is a correction to the current state in that you have current candidate solution that you have. The big thing that we want to take from here is that given this R will determine if you reach the solution or not, if the residue is 0 your current state is correct, the residue is not 0 your current state has a problem needs to be corrected. You can use this solve the system of equations to determine the correction. If the residue is 0 the correction will be 0, if the residue is 0 the correction is 0 as long as this is not singular it can be anything. And therefore it is possible for us to choose something that will make the convergence faster that was the other, other deal that we had. So we do this carefully because this determines when you reach the solution, you do this carefully because that will determine how fast you get to the solution, is that fine, okay, right, right and then we did a little more, uh, little more involved boundary conditions, application of boundary conditions here, right, using converting it to characteristic coordinates and so on, okay, is that all, did we do anything in the. Uh, then I wrote out the equations for the quasi 1D, right, quasi 1D and that was basically about it, right. What did we do after that? <coughs> we looked at unsteady flow, what, what, what was, what did we do after, uh, we looked at, I think we spent a little time on unsteady flow, right. We looked at the preconditioning the unsteady term, is that the, is that the deal, is that what you said, uh, yeah. So we use this, uh, we use see there is a there is a certain freedom that this gives this argument gives that is the reason why I want to emphasize this that is this determines that you get you have the solution and therefore this if this goes to 0 the correction goes to 0 and therefore whatever multiplies it goes to see that gives you a certain freedom then we look at it and say if I am looking for the steady state solution dou e dou x goes to 0 right dou q if you look at for the steady state solution dou q dou t goes to 0. And therefore if I multiply dou q dou t by some matrix it does not matter. So why would I do that? I would do that because the eigenvalues happen to be u, u plus a and u minus a and the problem gets difficult when either u minus a is close to 0, it means you are at going at transonic speeds, you are near transonic speeds or u itself is 0. The problem becomes extremely stiff, the eigenvector eigenvalues become very disparate propagation speeds become very disparate. So by pre-multiplying this by gamma it is actually possible for us to pre-condition the problem and if I am since I am looking only for the steady state this pre-multiplying by gamma dou q dou t does not really affect the steady state but affects the rate at which you are going to reach it, the same idea is that, right. There is something going to 0 I can multiply it by whatever I want as long as it changes the algorithm so that I get there faster but where I go is the same destination that is the key, okay that is the key. Is that fine, right? Then of course uh, we looked at uh, unsteady flows by adding a pseudo time term, right? Of course you can solve this directly using 
I think post uh, my uh, demo I did Runge Kutta method right and I, you can solve this equation without the gamma of course if you are looking for the if you are looking for the unsteady solution you can solve this directly. So if you are looking only for the steady state solution this is called uh, a time marching scheme if you are looking for the transient we are looking at a time accurate computation you could use Runge Kutta or whatever it is. But what we said is oh we have built up so much machinery for uh, steady state solution that if you add a pseudo time term rho q dou tau and you could then because that is going to 0 multiply that by a preconditioning right you could actually converge to the steady state in tau and get the unsteady solution in real time that you want okay. So we were then talking about acceleration schemes right and then we went back and basically remembered that high frequencies decay faster than low frequency we recollected all of these recollected all of these things and uh, of course in my review I think I have left out representation of functions the demo that import critical demo that I did of high frequencies and low frequencies but it does not matter right that high frequencies decay faster than low frequencies right and we basically came up with the multi grid scheme. So the demo that I am talking about is where we represented sin x using the demo I recollect the demo I will go back to the demo we talked about representing sin x using hat function that was a critical demo for us because it showed that for a given grid there was a highest wave number that we can represent that is very important or turning it around whether the wave number is high or low depends on the grid that you are talking about and if you say high frequencies decay faster than low frequencies then you are interested in using a coarse grid because the wave numbers then become higher frequencies what are low frequencies on a large grid become higher wave numbers right on a coarse grid hence the multi grid scheme. So what you basically do is you use grids of different sizes right you grids use grids of different sizes h, 2h, 4h, 8h and you transfer the residue this is a critical part you transfer the residue from the fine grid to the coarse grid and you transfer the correction from the coarse grid to the fine grid okay. So it is possible for you to actually go through this process of transferring the problem in a sense by you transfer the residue you are transferring the problem transfer the correction you are transferring the solution in a sense if you think about it okay. So it is actually possible for you to run your program on a very coarse grid you run your problem on a very coarse grid to eliminate to so that you convert what seem to be low frequencies on H to a relatively high frequency on 8H is that fine okay. So multi grid schemes of course and then we said though there is possible actually in fact why would we do that you would just basically start with a coarse grid and transfer in fact when we talked about Laplace equation in the beginning that is one of the things that we suggested that compute the solution on a coarse grid and transfer it as an initial condition on the fine grid, finer grid. So you could actually do this here you can start on the coarse grid get iterate a few times for Laplace's equation or take 10 time steps for Euler equations or whatever and transfer it to the next finer grid. So you could actually go from 8H, 4H, 2H, 2H and then start your go through this process and typically the critical thing that you want here is what is the thing that we have to recollect here work units that is the that is what you always work units that one sweep on the finest grid right in one dimension is equivalent to two sweeps on the coarser grid is equivalent to four sweeps and if you go to multiple dimensions of course that gets even better right so you would expect that in three dimensions multi grid will work extremely well right the axial convergence rates that you will get in wall clock time how quickly you get to the solution will be much better what did we do after that after multi grid methods calculus of variation we looked at uh, so calculus of variations basically comes back and says so we are back to this business I am representing a function the only thing is now you actually have a measure of something so you say that I have uh, if I if I think the example that I gave is if you are coming from your dining hall to its classroom what is the shortest path that you so you can come up with some kind of a, a measure or a metric to see which is a function that you want like you, you are looking for the you are looking for a you have a functional 
you have a measure and you want to minimize that measure and from there we derive the Euler Lagrange equations we showed then that the relationship between the variational problem and the differential equation right because it involves optimization there is a differentiation and setting equal to 0 kind of a process that you do to get the Euler Lagrange equation. So in that sense the Euler Lagrange equation is like a derivative right the Euler Lagrange equation is like a derivative right so you differentiate find the first variation and you get this derivative and we showed that uh, Laplace's equation we found looked at the variational form of Laplace's equation and showed that you could get Laplace's equation directly which was analogous to the earlier uh, Ax equals b being, rep, rep, being a minimization of a quadratic cube it was analogous to that okay and we basically said that yes so it is possible for us sometimes to solve it in the variational form if you get the variational form the amount of smoothness required of the function is not as much the smoothness required of the function is not as much you do not need as many derivatives right so it is possible for us to reduce the derivative requirement fine and very often the expression in the variational form is simpler than, than in the differential form very often that is so but it is not always easy to get the variational form given the differential form okay you do not get something for nothing right so there is a there is an element there is there is a difficulty in doing that okay and finally of course we end with today's class so I will just recap put it on the with back to the big picture so the big picture possibly is that this is the reality as we see it so you have uh, right and of course I have put this little brown to indicate and from here reality you get uh, this is the perception this is what you see so this is what it is I just draw some I can draw anything there because we cannot see it is what I am saying right this is a perception and from this perception we come abstract out a model it would be ideally in a figure that I drew it would be an exact circle right because we have with mathematical precision we abstract out a model and then of course we cannot even solve the model we cannot even get this model so we end up doing a, a computer program which is discrete the idea is that is that is that is pictorially that is what I am trying to represent here. So this is uh, modeling this is discretization if you want you can check consistency whether this model is consistent with this as the number of sides of that polygon increase does it become the circle that is consistency and you can do validation you can check perform an experiment and you can check whether the result is fine cannot do that the scientists and everybody constantly trying to do that am I making sense and of course here you there is a there is a so there is a test that you would do here also you can add terms remove terms oh the flow is inviscid the flow is viscous right so they all of that all of that stuff is happening here but once you decide to do the Euler equation you go back here so the two possibilities either you say this solves this and therefore I validate there but you look at this you know they are not so validation is validation that is it right and then no more than that fine okay thank you very much.